In a world where people actually watch the stuff their friends recommend, this is I'll Look at Yours If You Look at Mine. Eating all alone up here again. So, what do you think of that American flyboy? He's something else, isn't he? As soon as he saw me, he asked me to marry him. So I told him of the three pilots I've married. The first died in the war, the second died in the Atlantic, the last one, he died in Asia. So you've heard something? I got the call last night. They found his remains in some remote part of Bengal. It's strange, Marco. I've been waiting to hear something for three years, but now I can't even cry. I just feel numb. Maybe I've run out of tears. Yeah, well, the good guys always die. Cheers. To a good man. Marco, I want to thank you for keeping an eye on me and my restaurant all these years. I just can't tell you how much your friendship means to me. Well, you know, it's a great place, except for that ugly photograph you keep hanging on the wall up there. Hey, that's my favorite picture. I can't believe you scribbled over your face. That's the only picture left of you as a human. How are you ever going to break that stupid curse on you, Marco? Out of context, that is just such a weird quote. Um, yeah, how are you going to break that curse, uh, Marco? If, if you think in the audience this would be the central question of the story, you, like myself, would be sadly mistaken. Spoiler alert, I do think that they vaguely hint at something in the voiceover epilogue. Always the best policy to tie up a loose plot point real quick, like... I know what you're thinking, but it worked for Hal. It did, but shh, let's not encourage them. Greetings, lookers! Welcome to this edition of I'll Look at Yours If You Look at Mine. The podcast that's one part movie discussion, one part game show, where we never know what we're watching next. I'll be your host, Ben Mitchell, and you can find me on Twitter and most social media with the handle at RedHenMedia1. Look for that red hen icon. And welcome one and all to the fourth episode of Series 10. There will be five episodes in this series, and the series theme is Eastern Animation, for which we've all secretly submitted one movie. Now, we all guess who submitted what in our Who Done It segment, and at the end of the series, the winner is awarded a Who Dundee trophy, along with a bonus prize. This series' bonus prize is a $25 gift card and a fantasy sword pen, as pictured here, and which we've thoroughly established that this is the only one of its kind in the entirety of the multiverse. We ask you to accept this dubious fact without compunction, please. But that's not all, because you are the X Factor. Yes, there's also an audience choice selection somewhere in the mix. So please head on over to redheadmedia.com slash audience choice, submit your pick, and we may watch and discuss your movie on the show. Again, that's redheadmedia.com slash audience choice. Now, today we'll be discussing Porco Rosso, 1992, which is a Japanese animation adventure comedy fantasy feature film. Woo! It's currently streaming on HBO Max. And welcome to this very special episode. Today we're discussing Porco Rosso, as I said, which is actually a delicious culinary delight that will impress even the most distinguished palate at your next soiree. That's right, we're a cooking show now. Of course, I'm really talking about Studio Ghibli's 1992 anime about a former World War I pilot cursed to look like a pig. But I'm not talking solo, and I'm not flying solo either, because I'm here with my distinguished co-pilots who are probably going to propose to the next dame or dude they meet, depending upon their preferences. So we better scramble to the airboat for a rollicking aerial showdown before they sanction a boxing match in the Adriatic Sea. Hey, gang. Hey. Hello. 
Tchau. <risos> Tchau, bela. <risos> With us today, we provoke the one, Mr. David Schwartz. That's better than uh, Chris Pratt does as Mario. And uh, hey, everybody, the game is on. And my good friend, the incendiary James Pepe. It's a me, James Pepe. Porco, uh, also Rosa. I don't know. <laughs> You say Porco, I say Rosa. Isn't that that game, the pool game that people play, the Adriatic Sea? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah right. <laughs> Porco! <laughs> it involves punching for about 15 minutes. Uh, yeah. just, <laughs> just a good walloping. I, re I, read a, I read a review I read a review of the movie who described that as a They Live style uh, like fight. <laughs> that that is laugh. an apt description of that scene. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Remind, it totally reminded me of of they live exactly and speaking of sunglasses we're also joined by the irrepressible gentleman jim scott hey jim put on the glasses jim put them on hey <laughs> <laughs> i wear my sunglasses at night right and uh greetings gentle listeners and friends happy to be here happy to have you all all right guys let's start off by checking today's headlines. Extra, 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 read all about it. Okay, Mr. Devin Schwartz, what did you find in the news today? Uh, yeah, this one is hot off the presses. It's a, a ticker tape running across the bottom of my screen here. Let me see if I can read it in time. A group of nice guy pirates and bounty hunters who were... Let me see if I have this right. Centrists in a war against fascism have beach party as war rages around them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Can't deny it. <laughs> kind of want to try it. <laughs> yeah, kind of crazy. Which is like the apocalypse now surfing scene in a way. It's Miyazaki's version of that. Yeah. Yeah. Surf's this up. Is a very, Surf's up, everyone. Very, this is, yeah, this is, this, is, this is Italian style fascism. It's just like yeah, we're, we're fat. Sure, we're fascists. Whatever. <laughs> you got wine to drink and pasta to eat. Right, exactly. But there's a spaghetti involved, so. Yeah. You know, it's a good, no? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> James Pepe, <laughs> save me from this bit. <laughs> what did you find in the headlines <laughs> today, sir? I found, uh, I found this uh, simple headline. When pigs fly, <laughs> delight and whimsy follows. <laughs> <laughs> Simple but effective. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Very good, sir. Love it. All right. That brings us to Gentleman Jim Scott. What, did you find anything interesting while perusing the newspaper today? Yeah, actually, I went to a blast from the past. I looked up uh, in the movie review section of this movie by none other than Siskel of Siskel and Ebert. And wow. Uh, wow. I got I got a direct quote, and it follows. I would say to always trust a 17-year-old female engineer wearing red Ronald McDonald shoes, but I don't want to be mansplaining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those shoes and those, those stockings, man. That's, yeah. She's got, a, she's got a real fit going, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, they uh, diverge into the burger-making business from the airplane manufacturing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Spaghetti burger. They're going to love it. <laughs> you, you, you hate it now. Wait till you have it in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for the excellent headlines, as always. Um, why don't we give this combo a little context and do a little segment that I like to call the rundown. There's the rundown you asked for. I may have expanded some areas that you weren't prepared for. Great. But I think... Fax that to everyone on the distribution list. Um, uh, sure. Do you want to look at it first? Do I need to? No. No, no, I just want to make sure we have the same format. Always awkward. So, uh, our boss, Charles Miner, best boss ever, he's listening, just demanded a rundown and... That would be Jim from The Office, 
handing the dossier over to our very own gentleman, Jim Scott. So let's see what Jim has for us on Porco Rosso. Oh, me? <laughs> um, You're up, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So this this beautiful uh, Studio Ghibli um, film, uh, as as you have been had said earlier, uh, was uh, made in 1992. It had a runtime of one hour and 34 minutes. It had a, a hard rating of PG. And a hard the, PG. Yep, the hard PG. And the simple synopsis is as follows. In 1930s Italy, a veteran World War I pilot is cursed to look like an anthropomorphic pig. Um, as far as the ratings, Rotten Tomatoes rated it 95% on the tomato meter and 87% audience score. So it was much loved. And then IMDb, uh, it received a 7.7 rating. Uh, as far as Studio Awards, it won um, from the Nikon Sports Film Awards, the Ishihara Ujiro Award, and then also from the Man Manichi Film uh, Concourse, it won both Best Animated Film and Best Score. So it took well, some awards. I can say I'm nice. thoroughly familiar with each and every one of those prestigious awards. Yeah. So I will, I will give it a ring up. <laughs> tongue in cheek but uh yeah that's cool it garnered some awards good for them yeah and as far as the dubbed version um on the uh, uh english side it had uh, michael keaton as the voice for uh the porco rosso and carrie ells as the voice of the american texan pilot curtis he just uh, notables. Everyone has something to say about friends. that. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, yeah, he was the voice of the cat in the other movie we watched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the cat in the yeah. other other movie we didn't watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he must have just signed up for a block of these things. The voice, the voice of the female uh, lead, not uh, mm -hmm. oh, now. I'm forgetting everyone's name. The one who owned the restaurant. Um, the she was the same. She was the same voice as uh, the. Um, as the as the lady from Spirited Away, my my. Oh, I correct? think she sounded familiar. Which yeah. which lady from Spirited Away? You know, I'm terrible with names. The the, the, the one who the, the only other human. No, the the human that helped her out. The, the, out of the like train mentor, ticket. her like the oh, mentor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I so they must have been signing her. people up for. Uh, well, yeah, when I looked up the actress, I didn't recognize anything she'd been in, so I was like, "Why am I recognizing her voice from?" But I, yeah, I didn't go back far enough, I guess, to see Spirited Away in there. Yeah, it kind of dawned on me, and I'd seen this a few times, and it, it just occurred to me this watch for some reason. But anyway, I digress. A little interesting tidbit, maybe. Yeah, definitely. But uh, with the uh, notables and um, the elementary descriptions out of the way, uh, let's say that we play a game of Rundown Recreation. <laughs> Perfect. So the name of this rundown recreation is Rosso Revealed. And true to the form of the pirate being a motley crew, these questions will also be motley in their form and fashion. There will be an a, a multiple choice A, B, C, D. There will be true, false. There will be short answer. Okay, a little mix up, mixed bag. Absolutely. Kind of like a, kind of like a Miyazaki movie. It's like a yeah, and I, random <laughs> mixed up. And I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to uh, get yourselves ready before we delve into Rosso Reveal. Ramen. There we go. Nailed it. Mixed up all over. <laughs> Got it. Made it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Timely too. And, and, all right. <laughs> and we, can, we can talk later about what what broth we use and what we like to put in our ramen. But uh, yes. Let's, Told you yeah, this was a cooking <laughs> podcast, man. <laughs> but let's run with the first question, shall we? 
Yeah, lay it on us, man. Perfect. So question number one worth one point. Hiao Miyazaki was the director of Porco Rosa, but who was the writer? Was it A, Hiao Miyazaki himself? Was it B, Akemi Okamura? Was it C, Tokika Kato? Or was it D, Ako Atsuka? And if you guys like, I can repeat those, those answers. Locking in my answer. All right, I see Ben, I see Devin. Do I see Pepe? There we go. All right, perfect. So answers revealed, please. All right. I answered A. A? A as okay. well. I went with A. C. You went with C. Well, two of the three got it correct because the correct yeah, answer yeah. was A, Hiyao Miyazaki. All of the other names, they were some of the voices in the Japanese version of this movie. Oh, okay. That's why they ring a bell. All right. Writer, director. I got on the yep, board. Writer, director. You got it. <laughs> you got it. it. All, right. All right. So, second question. True or false? Porco Rosso was originally planned as a 30 to 45 minute in-flight movie for United Airlines. True or false? I'll Always a good five. idea to put shows about planes crashing on an airplane. <laughs> All right, so I see everybody's locked in. Answers, please. And this question is uh, also I, worth one point. I think this is. I think this is a trick question. Uh, yeah, me too. I think. I think it was made as an in-flight movie, but for Japanese airlines. For ja yeah, not, for Japan you know, Air. I don't know why it would yeah. be United. Okay, oh yeah, so that was a trick question. Yeah, good call. So I see Ben has it true, and Devin and Pepe, you have false. Yeah. Well, Devin and Pepe, you are correct. So our hey. score as stands is Ben has one point, Devin has one point, and Pepe has a commanding lead here to so far with two points. And we're on. It was oh. being made as an in-flight movie though, right? But but for yes. Japan Air or something? Yes, you, you got it. Uh, I wanted to throw a little uh, trick uh, in there just in case you had read the trivia beforehand. Well, that's just, it's such a funny story about how this movie came about, so. Yeah. I, 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 when I read, I did a little reading about this movie and I, and I read that too. And it's just like, they paid him to make like a 30 minute in-flight movie. And then he made this. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the man has creative talent for sure. Yeah. All right, so moving on to question number three, and this one will be a short answer. What was the name of Porco Rosso's rebuilt engine after he had it repaired? Short answer, please. And I'll give you five seconds to lock in your answers. I see Devin is locked in. Pepe is locked in. Ben's in the think tank. <laughs> Six seconds to decide. All right, yeah. he, he got it. I was right about to uh, call five seconds. All right, answers revealed, please. I wonder if you're looking for something more specific, but do you remember this word? Yeah. I remember All nothing. Right. Uh, <laughs> all right, so Ben says, uh, Scooby don't know. Uh, Devin, what did you put? Ghibli. Okay, and last but definitely not least, Pepe, that's a good what detail. Did you put? I like that. Yeah, yeah, I have, uh, well, I, there's some, yeah, I have, I say a chip, but yeah, I have chip, so I don't know what the right way to say it's a gift sure. situation. Yeah, nobody can yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I am not vegan, so I will not punish you on uh, on, <laughs> on 
There is no punishment <laughs> for phonics here. So the correct answer is Ghibli and or Ghibli. So Devin hey. and Pepe, you got another point. All right. Celebrated getting so, on the board way too soon here. <laughs> <laughs> so right now we have Ben with a score of one, Devin with a score of two, and Pepe still with a commanding lead of three, but it, we're early. It is still anybody's game. <laughs> It was a real dog fight. <laughs> <laughs> In the Adriatic, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. So question number four. This will be on movie trivia. What was the other movie that Michael Keaton did in 1992 besides the voiceover he did for the main character in this movie of Porco Rosso? I will give you a hint. He also was a main character in this 1992 movie. And I will give you five seconds once again for this answer. So I see Pepe is on. Devin is on. And Ben Ben's is on. Answers, please. I don't think this is right. Yeah, me neither. I know mine's All not right. right. This is a fat uh, what? No. Okay. All right. So Ben had uh, a question mark. Devin, what did you have? Uh, I said Batman, although I think that was a couple years later. Okay. So uh, Batman. Yeah. Batman. I said Batman, Batman too, years. but I think it was. I think it. Oh, uh, was it later than '92? Okay, I thought it was a little earlier. Oh no! No, it was earlier. Fire. It was earlier. Oh, Wait, right. which are we talking about? Batman the movie? Yeah, the but the, the Michael Keaton Batman. Yeah, it was eighty nine. Yeah. Okay, so that's wrong. Yeah. Shit. So what was the other Michael? Okay, Jim, I'll lay it on us. All right, I'm gonna lay it on Beetlejuice? you because you guys were so close. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I believe Beetlejuice was 1988. I believe Beetlejuice is 1988. Oh, I could be wrong on that. Okay. Yeah. You guys you're were right. so no, yeah, close. You were snipping up the right tree. If you, like, mm -hmm. uh, if you just want to put return, uh, Batman oh, returns. Oh, of course. I forgot the he was even in here. Yeah. Yeah, with the Damn. penguin. Danny, Danny DeVito is a penguin. So, yep. nobody gets a point. We're still at our score, but it is time for a bonus question. Oh, these are good. And this one will be worth three points. Whoa. Oh, right. And it is this. What was Porco Rosso's real name? What was Porco Rosso's first, first and last? First and last, please. Six seconds to decide. Oh, the counter will start now. All right, I see Devin and Pepe locked in. Are we also locked in, Ben? I guess All so. All right. Oh, man. Answers revealed, please. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Marco. <laughs> Marco Poso something. Okay. That's what Ben yeah. has. Devin, what, what did you have? Uh, I said Marco Polo. Marco Polo. <laughs> okay. Obvious. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. And then last but not least, Pepe with the lead. What does Pepe uh, have? I have Marco Rosso. <laughs> so it's interesting because I looked this up in trivia and it was officially Marco uh, Pago. Spelled P-A-G-O-T. But I do remember in the movie, they also said Marco Rosso. In oh, in the, I, I think in the dub, it was different. Like there's two different names they used in the two different dubs, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so it, in the spirit of being fair, Marco, I would take either Marco Rosso or Marco uh, Pago or Pago. 
Um, so right. that, that means Pepe, you got three Pepe. points. Pepe! I went either way. Damn! He lapped, You're sitting uh, he lapped me like seven times. Man, big time. <laughs> well, well done. But uh, <laughs> it's not over yet. Uh oh. Oh shit. It Rise. is not over yet. Just like Porco Rosso was down, had to hide in the underbrush on an island, and was reborn with a rebuilt engine. Engine. In that spirit, we have a second bonus question, also Whoa. worth three points. So it still can be anybody's game. <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> if Pepe gets it wrong, we minus three points. I'm going to shake their ribs here. Turns into Jeopardy rolls all of a sudden. That's right. <laughs> all right. So this question is close to my heart, and it is also movie trivia. Here we go. Carrie L., who plays the voice of American pilot Curtis, is best known for the Princess Bride, but he is also well known for his role in this very iconic horror movie. What is the name of that horror movie? Six seconds oh, Jim. inside. Jim. Jim. <laughs> I made this oh my God, I'm drawing day. a blank. Even though, I, know, oh, okay, right? I remember now. Okay, so Ben, you're locked in. Pepe, you're locked in. And Devin, you're locked in. Reveal your answers, please. All right, so Ben, I see you put Saul. Devin, what do you have? Sounds of the Land. It's the only horror movie I know. Good guess. Yeah. Right. Silence of the Land, and a great movie. That also is all through the house. My arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. He's all through the house. <laughs> and Pepe, it looks like you have Saul as well. Yeah, just because we're playing a game. All right, perfect. <laughs> so, with the commanding lead of nine points, you are the winner of this particular Yay. rundown recreation, Rosso Revealed. Yay. I did it, you guys. Nice job. Thank you, Jim. That was excellent. My guns well didn't jam. Thank you, man. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yep. Watched your six, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Maneuvers happened. So, Devin, yeah. where does that leave our overall rundown recreation scores for the series? Uh, Do we have uh, a tally for that? Yeah, that puts me and Pepe tied at 17 points. Ooh, uh, wow. Jim, Jim in second with eight and Ben in third with six. All right. All right. I can run next time and catch up to you guys if whoever does the game offers tons of points. Hint, hint. Yeah, just a huge bonus point at the end. Yeah. For 20 <laughs> points. All right. I'm going to change my lower third back to where I'm winning, which is the overall <laughs> score. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Okay. Let's see if we can keep that going, though. And your number's, your number's so big. <laughs> Two. <laughs> You're also singular with your ones. I just uh, it's twice as it's big as mine. Thing. It's ugly, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, well, let's let's see ashamed. if we can change that though. I shouldn't be in the lead. Somebody else should be in the lead. Let's find out who done it and see if you guys can score some points. Shall yeah, we? Let's do it. We've reached the segment where we guess and reveal who is responsible for this week's submission. Winner with the most correct guesses at the end of this series will win a Who Dundee Award. Our current suspects include James Pepe and Audience Choice. And so Jim Scott, our uh, reigning champ from last series, will try to guess first. Who do you think done it, Jim? Yeah, so it's a 50-50 coin flip. We have, I'm sorry, audience choice and question James mark? Pepe. And me. And James Pepe. All right. Um, right. I'm going to go with James Pepe. 
Explain yourself. Are you, are you are you playing um, it close to the chest or yeah? Do you have a? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I believe that iron sharpens iron. If I kind of lay out, you know, the the strength of my argument, it just makes for a better competition. So okay. audience choice is the outlier. And I feel like when we're get playing this guessing game, if we're constantly distracted by audience choice, um, the uh, probability of having more wrong answers develops. So I'm not going to play audience choice at all. That means I will have the potentiality of only being wrong once due to audience choice. I'm playing the odds, baby. Pepe, I think it's you. Okay. All right. Is a man with a plan. Okay. I guess I'll go next. Um, so I think that this one is the audience choice. And I'm basing that off of, I vaguely recall something about when we first discussed this category that we're like, oh, when we do this, it'll probably be all Ghibli films. And then Pepe was like, Ah, but maybe someone will choose something that's not a Ghibli film. <laughs> and so I I feel like he said that, so maybe he would have taken that opportunity, but maybe he was playing the long game and throw me off. I'll admit that. And my reasoning is a little thin, especially based off of my hazy memory. But I'm going to go with my first initial instinct on that and um, see if my uh, memory is going to serve me or if it will betray me. So, Devin, am I remembering correctly or... Is it James Pepe? Well, I have to guess James Pepe. Here's here's my reasoning. I I, I do think okay, it's okay. Pepe's film. This feels like a Pepe movie. But uh, more than that, Ben, you are currently in the lead with two points, as we can all see, and uh, we all have won. And so if I don't guess the opposite of what you've guessed, I oh, have zero wow. chance of winning. It's it's impossible for oh, us to win if we yeah. don't guess the opposite of what you guessed. So that, I have to guess Pepe interesting. or risk uh, tying. So, that's a that's okay. a dangerous game. I played that game last week. And it didn't work out for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, interesting. I like this. Okay, and uh, James Pepe, uh, you are obviously going to choose audience choice or or uh, risk yeah, the wrath of the game um, show gods or something. I'm I don't gonna know. say I'm going to say audience choice. To be honest, I'm a little surprised to hear Devin say this is a Pepe movie, considering my track record. <laughs> On the show of <laughs> uh, the movies that I select, this is no November. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, be hard uh, pressed but, to uh, find that in this group of uh, movies we have to choose from. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So, audience choice for me. Uh, yes, one one audience choice, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I'll have what Devin's having. And no, so is it? So was that yep. three? For audience, nope, two or two and two. No, me and two. Jim say Pepe, and you and Pepe say audience. All right. Well, let me get the audience in here. Everyone that submitted. Yep. No. Um. So James Pepe, I guess it's down to you telling us whether or not this was your submission, and uh, otherwise it was the audience. So let's find out. This was my movie. I knew that it. That is correct. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Devin. well done, yeah, we... Devin. Dude, Excellent. We have a three-way. Yes. We have a three-way tie. Two, we two, do. two. Woo. I will say, in the event of the tie, we'll go to the uh, trivia winner, which we <laughs> may have oh, been fucked. Ben fucked. Oh, man. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to win it by those, trivia next those time. Numbers, those numbers could change next week. Yeah, it's true. So it's, those are not set to true on as much as the guesses. All are. you guys could get one wrong next week. Oh, no, wait. You, no one can get one wrong next week because it's the last movie. Mm-hmm. No, but it's we right. the, the trivia. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Now it's coming. Ben, it it could come down to the okay, trivia. Yeah. yeah, it could come yeah, down but to I the have trivia. no chance. That's I'm why we have the trivia. No fantasy sword pen for me. Womp womp. <laughs> There's only one. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry I to break so, it. I was so covetous. <laughs> yeah. Rick of Rick and Morty fame has searched the multiverse and come up empty handed. But the one. Just imagine, imagine, imagine the looks you would get from grading papers in class with that beautiful oh pen. Just like the... <laughs> my students, my students would think I was such a hep cat. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alas, like, we, we are in this reality. He does, he does have a dungeon. 
<laughs> I can confirm. <laughs> yeah. It was like a conspiracy group on Reddit or something. <laughs> Come to my philosophy dungeon, students. Where That's I write right. with my fantasy sword pens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now that we're deep into the dank dungeon of uh, Professor Pepe, we <laughs> oh, need no. to find out no why it is. Yeah, exactly. Why it is that you <laughs> chose what you chose. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is you got some splaining to do. So how'd you come up with Porco Rosso out of all the Ghibli films and animation? Yeah, so uh, back when, when I was back at home, um, my sister, so a long time ago, I got my sister a like DVD collection of a lot of the uh, Ghibli movies. Not, not, or I guess it was all of the actual like Ghibli Ghibli movies, right? And we just, we just decided to watch them. Um, and we started with the ones we hadn't seen because, you know, we'd seen a, she'd seen a bunch of, she'd seen more than I had. Um, but I hadn't seen a bunch of them, but I'd seen some of the big ones like uh, Spirit Away and Howls and stuff like that. And this one was just one of the ones that um, I hadn't seen. I don't remember if she'd seen it or not. Um, and we watched it and we were just like, holy shit, this is like the hidden gem of the Ghibli collection. It, we were like blown away by it. It was so good. Um, and so that was my first encounter with the with the movie. And actually re-watching it um, yesterday was only my second time seeing it. And mm. um, it was, it was, it met, it, it lived up to my memory of it. It met my sort of expectations. And um, the guys, I watched it with three, three other guys. Um, two of them hadn't seen it before. One of them had. Um, one of the guys that uh, we watched it with, it's his favorite of the Ghibli movies. Hmm. Um, and the two other guys who hadn't seen it before really, really liked it. And I was really happy because I was really happy about that because I didn't know if it was just me, uh, and my sis, you know, who are like, you know, fucking weebs or whatever, you know, <laughs> and we just happened to like this movie. Um, but they really liked it too. So I was, I was pleasantly surprised. I've heard a lot of people that this is their favorite, uh, Ghibli movie including some of my teachers. I One of the teachers, the first time I watched it, the guy threw it on in the middle of class while we were doing like a workshop class or something. Like, here's my favorite uh, Ghibli movie. And, and to us, okay, so, yeah, I do hear about that. But uh, who's seen it? Let's, let's, so Pepe, that was your second viewing. I've seen it before. Yeah, that's but let's, watch. Yeah, yeah, let's quickly go around. Devin, had you seen this one? I had not. Jim? No. Okay, so new new for two of you. I hadn't seen this one in a really mm -hmm. long time, um, personally. And um, although I always liked it, it was ne it was never my favorite. But this time, it just didn't. I don't know. It just didn't uh, capture capture me. And um, kind of the elephant in the room for me was that like I feel like the the love interest girl, the engineer that everyone was falling in love with. They, she was 17, but they portrayed her as kind of younger and that kind of like didn't seem to age. Theo, I think her name was. Um, that didn't really kind of like age well for me. Um, and so that kind of was a distraction. But uh, I will say that this clearly was like a, a thing where Miyazaki was fanboying about um, airplanes, which is great because I'm also a fanboy of airplanes. And as always, it was beautiful and man they can draw some fucking clouds in this thing and um yeah some the water. other thing that i liked is i just really like even if i if if i'm not completely like behind something or or like into it which this viewing just didn't do it for me um i i always like am totally attracted to the like 2d drawings like i know it's all 2d and that every frame was drawn by someone hand and was painted and and so that in and of itself is enough to just like fascinate draw me in um but yeah some of the other plot points i felt were like kind of clunky too but not not in a way that it, it's similar to howls like they're they're the story kind of like bumped around and meandered around and so it's like a, a, what you expect to get with the ghibli movie so i didn't like detract points for that specifically but how did it how did this one twenty thousand feet I don't even know if those planes could fly that high. How did that sit with you, uh, uh, Devin or Jim, if, 
Yeah, I'm interested you to hear what you guys think about this. Yeah, uh, first yeah, watch. I had kind of a similar reaction to you, Ben. I kind of liked it, but didn't love it. Is kind of how I felt. Um, there, the, I agree that the plot didn't feel as like, you know, sort of cohesive. Uh, just similar, yeah, similar to House, but what I think it lacked compared to House was the sort of like lovable characters that are just like fun to watch. The I think the only guy I really liked was the pirate, mainly because Brad Garrett's voice is fucking awesome. Like it's pirates just fun are to great. To him yeah, uh, pirates, pirates are, are so a high funny. point. Yeah, they're the best. Yeah, no, they're they're, they're definitely a high point of the of the movie. Um, and then like the overall, the like way that like death exists in this world, and they like talk about it, but also like all these hyper violent things happening on screen never cause any death. It's like all this like very cartoon violence, but they're still talking about people dying. So it's like watching Tom and Jerry, except there's like a like Tom keeps talking about how their friend died. <laughs> like it's like. It felt very off-putting to me. I don't know. It was it was very strange. Like that's this, interesting. Like, weirdly, weirdly dark world where these like very undark things are happening constantly. It's very strange. It it is a mashup between like um, what's that black and white movie? Pepe Save me. Um, Casablanca, right? Oh, yeah. And, Casablanca. and yeah, Casablanca and and kind of a studio ghibli so yeah that is that is an interesting pairing so that was a so that was didn't quite work for you jim scott yeah. how did this sit with you uh, oh sorry finish your finish i was going to say one last thing was that the music yeah, yeah. did save it a lot for me i i love the music oh, in this movie it yeah. is so beautiful so yeah that helped a lot yeah. which is always i mean ghibli is always like that but this one i think Hisai, in particular Hisai. the music maybe stuck out more than others it's the it's the guy it's their john williams is I, mm. I'm gonna butcher his name. His Saini or his his Shaini or something. Yeah, he's great. Um, but Jim, how was this? This is also a first viewing for you. How did it yeah, go? Yeah, so so uh, it was kind of a mixed bag for me too. And um, you know, when it first opened up, and you see kind of like uh, you know Porco Rosso kind of coming out of the, this, I, I I put down in my notes Island Grotto. But I know it wasn't like a grotto, yeah. but it was like, and and you know that was based on a real place, which I didn't find out until, you know, looking up some of the facts about this movie. But you know, just coming out of that, you know, once he gets kind of the Batman signal equivalent, and the pirates being kind of gentlemanly scoundrels, you you, you know, they, yeah, yeah. you know they they took the schoolgirls and stuff, and and. And just the way people were acting, like the schoolgirls acting like it was a field trip, you know, yeah, and yeah. it was just a lot of fun. So setting that yeah, up. Yeah, strong in the opening. Agreed. Yeah, very strong opening. I was like, man, this is going to be another excellent Ghibli film that I'm just going to love. I think where it started kind of falling down just a little bit because I there was elements of what I just described throughout the movie right these cool moments these cool beats <clears throat> these you know characterizations and that type of thing but where it started to fall and I couldn't put my finger on it at first was Porco Rosso himself once he kind of had the time where we could see kind of what this person is all about I really was unattracted to his chauvinism, which I do understand that this movie came out in 1992 and it was kind of that age of movies that unfortunately some of these things played, but the way he played or, or the way he treated the engineer, you know, the 17 year old engineer, I was just like, I don't know. I was just off put by that. You know, um, and it's it's interesting because I'm not uh, off put by some of that chauvinism that occurs in, you know, my favorite fantasy series right currently right now, House of the Dragon. But for some reason in this anime, it was just off putting. Is there? And, um, uh, yeah. Let's get specific. If you do you have any or think about specificity, if you mm -hmm. could, like, is there any? Sure moment that comes to light that kind of kind of illustrate what you're talking about and you can think on that if, well, you, if you want if it comes up okay you get, sounds like you got some. yeah it, it was kind of the i know michael keaton did the voice and i'm a fan of michael keaton but i think that yeah, totally. was this 
the first element where I'm just like, you know, I just don't really like this person. And then once, you know, his kind of his chauvinism was really illustrated with the engineer, you know, no, you know, you can't work on, you know, my plane in the beginning. And, um, you know, that whole scene where, you know, and then she comes back and says, well, if you don't like what I've done, you know, you can um, you basically you'll get the work for free and just sleep on it. I mean, she her comeback was strong. I really, really enjoyed her comeback, but just the way he was kind of putting her in that situation. Was it? Um, OK, so but obviously, like, you know, there's a character arc there and he gets better. But was it just too, yeah. too much, too quick, too soon to just kind of recover from it for you or? I don't think it was too much too soon. It is kind of, what I think of it is, is it's more of a feeling than it is any sure, sure. Cro- concrete detail. I think it comes down to a je ne sais quoi. It's just everything together. It's just, I really didn't like the protagonist uh, that much. And that color, unfortunately, because, you know, you guys have stated in so many ways how beautiful this anime is, but it colored my experience of the anime mm-hmm. from then on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel similarly. I was just, I had a kind of a different take on it. And I was curious like mm-hmm. how that went for you, but yeah. Um, I, I think that like, it's just kind of a dated like take on things. And I get that it's from this era, but I'll, that's going to like be a hindrance for some viewers. Like I felt it was yeah. a distraction that, like, it basically was like, okay, well, the, and even when they're, like, fighting the American, it's, like, all about, like, who's going to, like, win the hand of the maiden, you know, and they're beating each right. other up over the girls and stuff. And it was just, it was just kind of felt dated. Like, I, I don't want to be harsh yeah. or anything about it, but, like, it, I, it's just going to count against it now. And, um, you know, it came out in 92, and it was kind of about an old era. So, I mean, it makes sense in that regard, but. It's, mm-hmm. it's one of those things where you, if you're going to watch this with a modern audience, you're just going to get that reaction, I think, a lot of the time. But Devin, was there anything specific you disliked or stood out for you um, as a as a like a, a positive? Uh, yeah, I've got I that did stuff like, too. But. Yeah, I did like Theo as a character like that. That she was yeah, really she was cool great. And- honestly felt more like a Ghibli protagonist to me, especially since most of the Ghibli oh, movies yeah. I like most, are, yeah, have these, like, young uh, female protagonists. She had a lot of, of that, like, protagonist energy, and it felt like... Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, Porco was more of a side character that, like, they, you know, I don't know, maybe they got Michael Keaton to voice him, and then they're like, all right, well, now I gotta write more, but I don't know, I don't know if that decision was made even while they no, were it, the movie. No, because it came out, Michael Keaton didn't voice it until, like, the 2005 Disney re-release here in oh, so uh, it was just yeah, it's just know. how they wrote it back in the 90s it's like a rare it. a rare writing mistake from a studio that rarely makes those uh it, it felt a little weird that he was he was focused on when yeah he is kind of it did kind of want to be about theo in, yeah. in, in a way because she like the, the the feeling the energy of the movie really picked up when she was introduced again like it was at this yeah. like really cool the intro obviously knocked it out of the park and then it kind of like the energy level drops down and then it picks back up when she's introduced. And plus the workshop is really cool and the whole town coming together. That's one of my favorite sequences Yeah, uh, in the movie as well. Uh, and just like the rebuilding so, of the plane. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So at, at least on this topic, I'll, I'll make two, two defenses for this. Sure, movie. sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. let's hear it. First, first is that neither of the female... I guess leads uh, the uh, Gina is not quite a lead, but Gina, that's her name. Yeah. So neither of them were ever, at least I don't think were ever like damseled in this movie. You're right in saying that like, that like Theo was sort of put up as like a prize to be won, but you never get the sense that like Porco needs to actually like save her or whatever you know or or gina for that matter right they can like true, take care of themselves true. yes yes the other the other thing i'll say is that um and my friend one of the one of the guys that i watched this with last night told me about this um i guess when ghibli was making this movie 
they were making another movie at the same time. And I don't remember which one it was. And so one of the other directors, um, so, so Miyazaki wanted to make this movie and the people that he was looking to get the money from were like, look, this movie about a fucking pig who like flies World War One, like, what is this? You like, no. And they're, and so the other movie that they are making, they gave all of Ghibli's animators to, to work on. And so Miyazaki had to use all of these sort of like, quote unquote, second tier animators, and they were all women. And everybody was like, this movie is going to be shit. You're not using the real animators. All these animators are women. It's going to be huh. garbage. And the scenes where all of the women in the town come out to build Porco mm -hmm. Rosa's plane is him. Like the idea is that like he's paying homage to all of these women who made this movie with him. And so yeah. like, all of yeah. those women are supposed to be representative of his animators who he got like quote unquote stuck with because they were the second tier animators because they were all women and they made this movie and it's, and it looks, I mean, that's it looks pretty beautiful. cool. You'd never know it wasn't, it wasn't like the best people they had in the studio on this job. So they really rose so to those the, are my, yeah, yeah. So those are, those are my two defenses that I'll make for this movie. I think, yeah, I think Miyazaki they wrote, no, they really did rise to the challenge. Yeah, yeah. I think Miyazaki probably knew what he was doing when he was putting all these sort of like gender or sort of power dynamics into the movie. But there are a lot of like, all of the women in this movie are incredibly strong willed and none of them are ever damseled. And they're always putting Porco for the most part in this place. And he, the power dynamic, they're, they're like, there's this sort of cultural power dynamic at play, but that never seems to like, be sort of like affirmed by the people in the movie, you know, or like the, 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 the way things play out in the movie. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, so that's, that's strong things. I, I say, I would say as a response that I feel like it's for a studio that is known for doing strong female leads. I think, I don't know if he wanted to go in another direction or it was just how he adapted the story, but I feel like it still wanted to be about, you know, just his, I, if, even those situations aside, I think just based on the energy level, like Porco is such a like conservatively played character. It's hard to mm -hmm. like for him to carry the story and thus the interest and keep the viewer watching. It really does need those other characters and it doesn't it maybe I think would have been even better if it had been just somehow Porco Rosa was like a main secondary supporting character and it was really about Bio's story or uh, Gina's story or something. Because it, it seemed like even the pirates, like everyone around him was kind of more interesting in a, in, in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But. Well, but if you didn't, if airplanes, you didn't have. That's the real highlight. Well, but if you didn't, <laughs> if you didn't have Porco Rosso as the central character, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't have you wouldn't have been able to have his 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 the the story that he tells to Theo, which is sort of the centerpiece of the movie and is like you're talking about one the, of the vision best. yeah yeah that he his has like sort yeah. of dream sequence that he that he yeah tells that to was Theo a high, as a, high as a as a bedtime story and that was like you could that's an incredible like that's an incredible piece of cinema right i mean if you play it from just go with me for a second if if if, if he is the main character and she could still end up on that beach with him and the kind of like meeting like she he's kind of like a legend right and kind of like batman and then he like she you know finds out he's real or something and ends up on this island and he tells her the story i could see that being a thing you know i just don't know what her it, it would take it would take yeah. a lot more work but i think i don't know i just feel like maybe he doesn't like he's so good at writing this specific character, like maybe he's not as good as at writing the male lead characters as he is with the female lead characters or something. Yeah. Yeah, or maybe we just shouldn't think about him as like the lead, because even though the story sort of centers around him, like it is easier saying, to like think of all of the other characters sort of beg more attention every right? every scene. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Yep. And maybe that's on purpose too. Maybe he's, yeah, maybe that's 
They definitely needed. They definitely needed to be there. That's for sure. Yeah, I'll say that. Yeah. 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 So, Jim, how, any standout? Any standout part? I, I'll say that 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 vision sequence is haunting and and all all that it is. It was and incredible. This, yeah. And Devin, I know you had a problem with the tones, like not mashing up. I think that's you who said that. Um, but when they do focus on one tone or the other, they both kind of work. I just don't, I don't know that I can convince you that they'll work together or not, but, um, man, that was haunting. I still think about that scene. When I think about the movie, I definitely, my mind goes to that, but Jim, uh, did you, was there anything stand out that you really enjoyed about this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, just like you, I really enjoyed when, you know, all of the women came together and I, I definitely take your point, Pepe, um, just, just a, as an aside, you, you know, that all the women, you know, came together, um, that, uh, uh, Theo was very strong, you know, and it was almost, you know, um, listening to what you had said, and, uh, you know, what you had laid out, it's almost like, um, you know, first it was Theo that kind of put Parco Rosso in his place, right? Because she definitely is competent, you know, and knowledgeable and the best one for the job. But then it takes a village and it takes a village of women, you, you know, and I feel like that was the extra punch to try to, you know, to also put um Porco Rosso in his in his play as far as that. So that that scene was really cool. I really enjoyed that. Um I am, you know, I, I like action. So my standout scenes were the strong beginning because there was so much dynamic things going on. You know, you had the pirates that were a certain caricature that I just loved, right? The the fact that they were willing to take hostages and the fact that they were kind of bumbling, you, you, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and they were letting the kind of the schoolgirls kind of control the action. Like they, they were able to jump out. They were able to uh, like control the gun port a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so they didn't fire on Parco. They were like the gremlins. You... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Man, that opening sequence is so good. It's Terror so at funny. 5, it's so feet. charming. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, it's just so yeah. good. Yeah. And it sets such strong tones. And then you have mm -hmm. even the people on the ship where they make that arrow and they're like doing the little different SOS iteration. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And all of this is like going back and forth and it's so dynamic. I love that. You know what I mean? And um, man, the action and all of the other action sequences, you know, follow suit where you had a lot of different moving parts a lot of things that you know you had to pay attention to and they were a feast for the eyes um i will say this too pepe that when i was watching this movie you know the way you enjoy a movie very much depends on the mood you are in at the time yeah right and i was distracted um i had gone out of the room you know, a few times to get something. And sometimes I, you know, you know, and then to use the restroom or whatever. And sometimes I paused the movie and then sometimes I didn't. So I already was um, kind of in a distracted state. And I did firmly believe that that is some of the reason why I didn't enjoy this movie, maybe as much as I would have had I been another you know, movie, you know, I, I'm sure we've all done it where we watch a movie and we don't like it or we don't like it as much. And then we see it at a later time in our life. And they were like, oh, my gosh, you know, this movie is a masterpiece, you, you know. And so uh, what I'm saying is I don't think I was like in the best mood to sit down, be present, be focused and really kind of be open and receive all the beat as they were coming. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's fair. I mean, like with, with the Ghibli movies, they're all, I mean, there, there's something about them all that's common to them all, right? Like if you, if someone Definitely. sat down and, and put you in front of like, you know, showed you a, a, a variety of say 10 movies and two of them were Ghibli, 
mm-hmm. you'd be able to pick not even just from the animation right like the animation is so iconic but even just from you know the the way the movies go and just sort of the, just everything about them right it, it's very specific it's very peculiar to ghibli right mm-hmm. but on the other hand the movies are so different that when you sit down to a ghibli movie you don't necessarily know what you're getting into right and like for me on the second watch i knew that i was going to be in for this sort of like light comedy Mm -hmm. um sort of like romantic sort of like mediterranean sort of like quasi love story right and i was like i was like psyched for it because i was i was excited to watch it again because i had liked it so much the first time and but this movie definitely has a mood right Mm -hmm. it has that sort of like wistful sort of nostalgic kind of um loves that could have been but weren't sort of Mm -hmm. feel to it and it's post-world war one and so the world is like at the same time, like reeling from the great war, right. Mm -hmm. But also like, so happy that the fucking great war is over, you know? Yeah. Um, And I think, and I think, I think the, the, the moods and the themes of it sort of try to hit that weird sort of balance of that feeling at the time of like this incredible sadness at what has just happened to the world, but also Mm -hmm. this like incredible happiness that like, because then it's like the roaring, 20s right or yeah right because like the world is like the entire world is like the worst fucking well, over Let's actually the fun, de- you know <laughs> yeah the depression just hit when this movie started basically like that's why the oh, men yeah. are gone out of the italian shop it's oh, like 20, yeah, yeah yeah it's like 20 point. it's like takes place in 29 or something like that so it's just yeah they've had this like 10 years after and uh, or or something just to like set that up mm-hmm. yeah Okay. Well, maybe I don't know what but, I'm talking about. No, no. I mean, your point still stands. It's just right at the end of that. Like, this is, it's another dynamic shift. Yeah. So it's like they're kind of brought back down to, to Earth again, as it were. But I, I kind yeah, of felt like yeah, I, I moved. Yeah. yeah. I kind of felt like I moved on without giving Jim that was good of you to jump in there and respond to to Pepe. But Devin, did you have anything to respond to as far as, as what he was talking about? Uh, well, I wanted to agree with Jim that I also found myself sort of oddly distracted while watching this in a way that I didn't with uh, Hauser or Whisper of the Heart um, or even the the one I liked less that I can't remember now. Um, Wonderful Days. I With this one in particular, for some reason, I like I found it very hard to focus on. And maybe it was part of that sort of uh, uh, meandering storyline. But I, uh, yeah, I had a hard time like just sitting down and watching this. I can't really put my finger on what caused it. Yeah. I watched it in big screen because um, I'm hoping that people mm. will eventually join me. Well, it, it, it's it, yes, and that's kind of my point is when I is when I put on the headset and lock in for a movie. There's really not much to do but watch the movie. So at least yeah, sure. uh, I did it that way. But yeah. I've also seen this before a few times. It's just been a while, you know, for me. Um, yeah. So I can't well, speak movie, to that. But. This movie does have a fair amount of action in it, but I wouldn't say that mm-hmm. it's like rich with incident mm-hmm. in the same right. way that Howl's mm-hmm. is. Or no, it gets slow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Even like yeah. the rebuilding but, of the but plane. But it wants to strike like, a move, a mood. Sorry, it does, and it and it does. Nobody does slow as well as Studio Ghibli, right? Yeah. I mean, we're talking about the concept of Ma and like capturing those things. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, you right. do you do get a good sense of that Italian city and and it's it's wonderful, you know? Yeah. Um, but you're right. Yes. The amount of incident that happens, it's not. Yeah. And I mean, if you if you look at the timeline, this is fairly early on in in their movie making, you know, Mm-hmm. Um, it would be yet another 10 years before yeah. they were doing uh, Spirited Away, right? So they they have all this, like, uh, dare I make an airplane analogy of a runway uh, before, like, hitting the point where they took off and, and started really, like, just hitting the, like, general audience masterpieces that are probably going to just be considered classics, you know, basically across the board. However. I don't know. I we're still in, I feel like we're kind of in the minority here based on the 
the Rotten Tomato scores and, and the IMDb scores were very high. People seem to yep. love it. The, I read some of the reviews. They loved it. So I don't know. It's just this viewing. I, I just, just kind of it's funny when I haven't watched something for a long time, you watch it from, you know, a, a different era and just things stand out that you didn't notice before. And it was found it a little distracting. But I did watch the yeah. movie and there was plenty there that I really enjoyed, especially I just drank in the lush visuals as always. And I had no idea that that, that, that it was like a second tier crew and then like you got the female crew and they rose to the challenge and delivered such a, a beautiful work there. That was a nice, that was a nice thing to, to learn about. It, yeah, I thought it was really cool too. It, it makes it interesting, Ben, and you, and you hit on a... Um... Uh, a, a great point. You know, this movie was very well received, more so oh, yeah. than so many others. So, you know, I know we're going to grade this, and that's, you know, that's in the periphery. And it, real uh, quick, mm -hmm. these were modern reviews. These were not old reviews. I looked at the dates. These are like mm -hmm. 2019, 2020, like, like late 2019 or 20 teens and, and onward reviews. I made sure to check the dates. I'll just say, well, yeah, I mean, relevant. Tomatoes didn't exist in 92, right? Yeah. No, yeah, but so I, yeah, it, I didn't think it exists in 2004 either, but yeah, they, they sometimes get reviews from like newspapers back in the day and will apply. Oh, do they really? Oh, they okay. do. They do. Yep. So I do check the dates, but yeah, the dates were like modern reviews. So it's fair to state so that or relevant. It makes it interesting, though, like if you're going to rate, you're going to review a film, right? A rating and review is incredibly subjective. We all know that. But to layer on an additional level of subjectivity being, so I'll just use myself as an example, being distracted, just being in a state of distraction for whatever reason, and seeing a lot of the beauty is there, but not being able to have the feels, so to speak. And this is a question that I'm posing to you. How do you grade or review or rate a movie when you know that part of the issue is yourself? In how you know receive you can... the movie. Yeah. You can somewhat divorce yourself question. from that and, and try. It is just off the cuff. I feel like I could probably divorce myself to a certain point, but you're never going to escape yeah. your own biases and opinions, mm -hmm. etc. That always comes into play. So you got to take into account who the reviewer is as well. You know, I think yeah. if you're if you're really looking to, you know. Read reviews and 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 formulate mm -hmm. opinions based on them. Um, what are your yeah. guys' thoughts on reviews in general or what or specific to what Jim said actually? Because it is an interesting well, question. I will say when I when I was in uh the journalism program at my college, uh I specialized in reviews. I did food okay. reviews mostly. Well, here we go. Um, but but yeah, because of that specialization, I learned a lot about that. I had specific I uh, went to specific seminars when we went to our like we uh, yearly convention and things like that that were all focused on that. And I think the best analog for this, uh, or, or one one good comparison, is that uh, when you go to a restaurant, you you have to take your experience into consideration. If mm -hmm. you if you get a, a waiter who you think if you think everything that was wrong with the meal was the waiter's fault, you know, like you found some hair in mm -hmm. it that you think was the waiter's hair, and it, even if even if everything you think was just that waiter, and he's probably going to get fired the next day, and therefore everything else is probably great your review has to reflect your experience. You can't make assumptions. You can't try to adjust course based on your one subjective experience. You have to try to look like it's just, it's just based on that. That's what happened. Um, just the yeah, facts, exactly. man. Uh, on top of that, though, I will also say that we aren't a journalistic organization and we have no, we've, we've no. made no promises of object objectivity or unbiased opinions. You know, we, we say what we believe. And I think we more than more than a, a publication, we're more subjective and, you know, it's just about whether you agree with us. And I think we show ourselves enough on this show that you probably know if you generally agree with one of us over the, the other three. Yeah. That's an important point. It, yeah. And I have heard that. So now switching gears and, you know, Ben, you had said that you had read some reviews. 
one of the pieces of advice that I've gleaned somewhere, I don't remember exactly where, when looking at reviews is over time, you look at enough reviews from that particular person that you see basically kind of a trajectory of what they focus on, their likes and their dislikes, much like Devin, you're saying, you know, uh, of our listeners, they listen to us long enough, they kind of know what space we encompass as we discuss films. Um, and you look for those that are looking for and uh, are subjective about the same things you are, or provide a um, another reference that maybe would not fall in line with yours, but they give kind of a, like a wider view of whatever it is that you are, you know, looking to um, see what people think. I think that advice is really good, but in this age of the internet, there is such a polyglot of reviewers out there. Sometimes it's a challenge to kind of stick with a group of people, you know? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, just, I mean, I that's it's... why you put it, yeah, that's why you formulate the, you know, the tomatometer meter meter thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you just get a sense of that. But I mean, I've, and then so with this, I fully <laughs> recognize that I'm, I'm in the minority with my experience, but I still have to say what my experience was. I'll give you a specific example, mm -hmm. though. One of the review, one of the only reviewers who didn't like this film is one, they, you know, how they give like a one line, uh, like sample of the review. His one line was, yeah. well, Miyazaki's failed again or something to that like point. It was like, okay, well, I can't oh, believe gosh. that guy, uh, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. It wasn't that yeah, harsh, but it was right. somewhere along hinting at that line, like he's fallen short once again kind of thing. It's like, okay. Yeah. If I, can, if I can go off on a tangent here about just reviews in general, I think that these days, especially like review, like the whole, the internet has kind of sullied the idea of reviews in general and especially mm. with the rise of mm. clickbait and things like that like mm -hmm. it, you cannot you cannot produce a, an, an objective fairly neutral review of something or even fairly positive because that mm. won't get a click like zero people will read your review that's like i watched a miyazaki movie it was pretty good you know like porker was a pretty good movie N no one's yeah. gonna read that it has to be best movie ever made worst movie ever made every time every movie is the best or the worst because that's the only way to get clicks. They have to be incredibly inflammatory in every review. Uh, for the most part, I'm talking about general, you know, like IGN and Kotaku, like places like that. They're really just trying to get people to click and they have to be flashy too bad. to get that done. Yeah, it's it's really sad. And yeah. it's like, it goes beyond video game reviews. That's just my sort of area. Um, well, I and, think and I think these days you, you have to pick a publication basically that you like rather than picking a reviewer. It's just like mm. which publication avoids things like that and for me it's polygon i read polygon but uh they also okay. have a policy of not rating games with like a numerical scale because that's largely like nonsense you look at IG, like the way that ign rates stuff is like fucking bonkers there's some some crazy stuff on there that ign they've... is just sort of based on however much the publisher like paid them right yeah it's it's, it's that's publisher. what i hear <laughs> they yeah. haven't rated something under but... an eight in like 20 years they just give everything yeah, an eight. Right. it's ridiculous that's that's they're just like it's like that clown makeup meme where they put on the yeah, clown yeah. makeup. <laughs> like I, okay, anyway, so but that 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 made me remember that I had been kind of questioning how much like reviews these days create like a feedback loop on things that just kind of runs away, like because uh, I will often see something that I think that I will like that doesn't get reviewed well that is not as bad as I anticipated based on the reviews and vice versa. Um. And so can you hype something into being popular or trash it like that? I think probably it kind of seems like that. Yeah. I mean, we see review bombing all the time. This, this practice That's of like, in review bombing. You know, a female, yeah. That. A female led movie yeah, gets, right. gets completely bombed before it even releases. And therefore no one could have seen it. And yet they, they was just the tomato, you know, round tomatoes was open just long enough that people just flooded with negative reviews before they even watched it. That happened to rings of power, I think too. Not that I'm, putting rings of power up on some kind of pedestal here but it wasn't as bad as the one star review bombs made it out to be um yeah. so yeah that that definitely affects it 
too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's chaos. <clears throat> the the fact that you, <clears throat> uh, Devin, talk about you know this hyperbolic, right? It has to be very, very good, good or very, very bad. It makes sense because I there's a a couple of like booktubers that you know I uh, watch, listen to, whatever that have talked on that. Like I have a view, you know, I have a re, you know, the way I'm reviewing this is there's good points and there's bad points and they already know kind of the comments that they're going to be made. They'll say, yeah, that's how I feel. I don't have to all, all, you know, like love it. I don't have to absolutely hate it. This is how I feel about it. And it, and they're answering exactly what you're talking about in the review world, or I think a subset of the of the review world, which is you you know hot or cold can't be in between. Hmm. So what I'm hearing yeah. is we need to jump on the hyperbole train or bus or <laughs> yeah, trolley right. or ferry or airboat, Biplane. as it were. Yeah, exactly. And get That's in on great. this fight. A great example of of like the reality of of you know when you get away from that what it looks like is the fact that if you look at most of our average grades for the movies we watch on this podcast it's like B's and A's A's and B's but nothing I mean we have very few completely tanked movies and we have mm-hmm. very few com- you know so we have no solid A's except for House Women Castle so uh, <laughs> when when you have a a council of people who <laughs> whose pick was that again uh, uh, time time will tell I don't remember. Um, <laughs> History, Some history jerk. will remember his Some name. Uh, <laughs> but no, when, when you have a group of objective people who are or not, not objective people, if you when you have a group of people who are all giving their honest opinions, you rarely mm-hmm. get perfect or terrible movies. You know, it is often yeah. the case that it's going to be great to some people and not so great to others, and that's okay. just how it is. So now I'm hearing we're the yeah. only ones doing it right. So that's good. Exactly. Come oh, definitely. base your base your opinions off of ours. You don't have to think for yourself. Just tune in to <laughs> I'll look at yours every week and get your opinions <laughs> fresh Don't off the to air. Smash that like boat. button and do That's all right. the other things. That's right. Email us. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, at least at least for for me, like I don't. Um, I I try to I I follow a a, a few reviewers that do mm. that work mostly on YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. And like some of them are. Some of them are people who I know who, whose like likes, generally speaking, coincide with mine. Mm-hmm. And others are people who are more like hit and miss. Like sometimes we like the same things and sometimes we don't. Mm-hmm. And like being able to hear, because, um, you know, like sometimes you want to see, like you're interested in a movie and you want to you want to hear someone who you know has similar tastes to you what they mm-hmm. think about the movie, right? And then there are, uh, like, a lot of times you want to hear, or at least I'll um, want to hear about, you know, um, if I like a movie or dislike a movie, and one of these people that I follow really has a sort of opposite experience with it, I really like to hear what their reasons are, um, because a lot of times we come out of movies and we just sort of have this, sense of like oh i really enjoyed that or mm-hmm. oh i didn't enjoy it and it you you don't really understand why until you reflect on it for a little while and then sure. when someone says like oh i did like that or oh i didn't like that and then they ask you like well what about it did you or did you not like it's not always like immediately apparent to, to even yourself like why you did feel that way um and so it, yeah it's like a cause for it's a cause for reflection, um, which is uh, good. Yeah. And I just to to uh, I know I'm I'm taking up a lot of time here, but I I'm, I've mentioned Mike D'Angelo a couple times on this podcast. Yes. He's a he's like a long time movie reviewer. He's seen like thousands of movies, you know. Mm-hmm. And so he watched this movie, and I I always I'm always interested to hear what he has to say. So he rated this movie as a 54 out of 100. He gave it three three stars. Right. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. yeah so like he didn't like it that much um and one of the things he says is that like miyazaki is a brilliant animator but he's a lousy writer and like I, you could understand why someone might think that um because like especially now like this movie and howls 
they don't so much have like storylines as they have like things going on in them, right? Like mm. there are things happening in this movie, but they're not like hitting plot beats, right? Mm -hmm. And so like that's that's perfectly fine. I can that's totally understandable, right? But like when like where he where his like review sort of like loses it for me is when he he starts like really focusing on like he I mean he's basically asking like why isn't this movie about the curse that's on this guy? And why don't we find out <laughs> like more my opening about his comment. curse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And like and he gets so focused on like he he's so like he's got it in his head that this movie needs to be about this thing he thinks it needs to be about. That happens that a lot he, with like reviewers. Yeah. 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 If the movie's yeah. not so, about like, what the thing they it. think it should be about, it's all over. And that's too mm -hmm. bad. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't I mean, he's obviously an, he's an accomplished like reviewer. And so like saying that I, I feel a little uncomfortable saying that just because it I could don't happen think, to anyone. Probably though. not. Really. Sometimes you get yeah, tunnel vision. I, yeah, so, I, I don't I mean, think I mean, I maybe that's real. Maybe that's not. But well, th listen, I, I did main criticism. I made that comment, too, but I made it as a joke and it really didn't bother me, to be honest. It was kind of like, you know, OK, well, this would be funny joke fodder. But it certainly notice I didn't bring it up in the review part because I didn't think it was yeah, that relevant. Yeah. It was one of those things that was like, OK, they have this thing figured out. We're seeing it's one of those tip of the iceberg things for me. So yeah, it's just like, yeah. yeah, OK, whatever. However. I just I felt that was relevant, but you continue, please. I mean, that was like that was like one of his, one of the main like sticking points for him. Um, and and, you know, he, he says things like or like here, I'll, I'll read a little bit. So he says, like, um, when he, when Porco tells Fio a bedtime story about his experience in World War One, will it reveal how and why he became a pig? Not exactly. If you squint really hard. There's a suggestion that Porco voluntarily assumed his his new identity, I guess out of survivor's guilt. And it's like, come on, man, do you need like every point of the story to be like spelled out to you? Like mm. think about what's going on in the movie and like figure out what like figure out what this curse is about. Two through, words. Like 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 show don't tell, you know? Or two like, words. Yeah, yeah. Show don't tell. Mm. No, no. Go ahead, Dave. Two words. <laughs> Here we go. Two words. Boba Fett. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's yep. it. Yeah, Case yeah. Closed. So say, say, I know what you mean, but say more about what you mean. Just that, you know, it was he was way cooler before they started like telling every yep. goddamn thing about him. Yeah, way cooler. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's there should be room for that stuff. There should. Yeah, there, there some things should remain a mystery. And uh that's very telling in this in this or they age can. where it's okay. Yeah. Well, it's really telling in this age that a lot of different studios, creators, what have you, are trying to create, you know, uh, this extended universe, whatever their work may be. And in the quest to do that, they want to explain eventually every little thing and get granular. And they even pay attention to you know, fan bases, and they're like, oh, these people are really, really interested in this aspect that we touched on, but didn't explain. We're going to make a movie about that. We're going to make a series about that, or right, what, yeah. what, what have you. And I love extended universes, right? I love House of the Dragon. I love all of that. I don't want everything revealed. I want yeah. there still to remain mystery, because it's in the mystery. It's in the subtle nudges that you really can allow your mind to run free. And I think that audiences should have a little bit of that magic that they themselves get to fill in the blanks. You, you know, the yeah, creators right. don't have to, the creators don't have yeah, to. I mean, like, could you, could you see like Porco Rosso in this movie being like, yeah, oh, yeah, kid, I got that survivor's guilt. It's like, no, <laughs> that wouldn't, he would never say a thing like that. Right. Yeah. And like, just because it's not like the fact that it's not spelled out for you, right, leaves room for interpretation, mm -hmm. which makes yeah. the movie incredibly rich, right? Yes. And that yes, part, absolutely. That part didn't need to be spelled out. It was implied right, exactly. pretty well, I yeah. thought. Like, even if you don't come to that exact conclusion, you're like, oh, okay, this guy had this emotional experience. And like, it was a, it was like a, 
fully sort of human, full lived emotional experience. And that that's a complicated thing. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always have like, it, there isn't always this like one to one correspondence between the way that a thing happens and you feel about it or the way yeah. something happens and, and how like the rest of your life plays out because of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Or does it need and to be so, solved like, on screen per se? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Exactly. And so like requiring that of a, uh, requiring that of, of, I can see why you would want to require that of some movies, right? But requiring well, they that do... of a movie like this just seems like wrong headed. She, I mean, they do state it as a question, like, when are you going to get this thing? So it is a clue to like, well, are we going to follow this breadcrumb? But I mean, it's just not spoon fed to you. And that's OK. Did it work yeah, for right. him? Clearly, it didn't work for that reviewer. I forget his name. Yeah. Uh, there's not enough shots of food. That's, that's my big huh. critique. Oh, yeah. food <laughs> okay. like that's a, that's valid. Food. Huh. Oh, you know, I mean, there it was, was place in Italy, like all the all the best. Food. <laughs> uh -huh. they, they did have a yeah, they did have like a spaghetti a dinner. Yeah, 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 at that dinner, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. I also would yeah. would like to say this that just not it's kind of less specific about the movie, but I thought that like they they took these. It, like I always say this, and I'll say it again, especially if this is your first time listening to us, it'll be relevant. They, I like seeing how directors who do a bunch of work, how these themes keep cropping back up. And clearly, a lot of this stuff evolved. And I think, in my opinion, got better or even perfected in later films, like the curse on um, Sophie in Howl's Moving Castle, like how they dealt with that. Um, they, they also don't spoon yeah. feed it to you, but I think that they he evolved what was kind of a pretty cool idea into something that was like really masterfully done in that film so it's it's almost like proto sophie's curse in this and um i don't know if this really has anything to do with anything at all it's almost like a stupid fan theory but um so porco rosso is cursed in some point to become a pig is this the same world then as spirited away where uh where sen's oh, parents yeah. are turned into pigs is is that how it oh, happened yeah, he definitely. went to a theme park ate some food well i mean didn't you notice that one of the like the, I forget what their gang name was, the like main pirate group. Like mm -hmm. those, one of those guys was the boiler room man in. It did look Spirit a lot. Voice? It was just like the or same the character guy. design? No, the, the yeah, character. yeah, yeah. It, wow. Okay. I got to go look at that again. Oh. Interesting. I mean, he didn't have like infinitely long arms, but it had the yeah, same right. face. It was, yeah, it was the not same yet. Face. Yeah. Not yet, but we do yeah, live in a world yet. where yeah, curses he, he exist. Becomes the boiler. Well, it's true. Everyone right. in Spirit Away right. is a spirit, so there is like some implication that they're like dead people. So I mean, it's possible maybe yeah. one of those pirates sure. died and became. Yeah. A... Well, All right, it's canon. All right, we we, we agree. Uh, I okay, and I just spirits are a little different in Japanese lore. They're not always dead people. And it's occurring and to me. Oh, okay, go ahead, Jim. Oh no, I was just gonna a quick aside. It's another extended uh -huh. universe. If that's true, then. Yes, there you go. Yeah, it's like right. the Stephen King thing, but applied to, to uh, Miyazaki and Studio yep. Ghibli. Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess we didn't mention the direct translation of Porco Rosso as Red Pig, in case anyone was curious about that. Mm. Uh, yeah. mm. that, uh, that name shows up in, I think, Whisper of the Heart. There's something, I remember seeing Porco Rosso yeah, in one of the other movies. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, um, Which came out after this, so the, that makes sense. On the, few years. On the clock. Right, yeah, that's what it was, the, the clock. clock. The clock with the, oh. the gnomes or whatever. All right, yeah. all right, good. Yeah. Good Easter egg, nice. Wow. Nice yeah, I, I noticed that, and I just started sweating like that, that, like, Key and Peele <laughs> gif. I was yeah. oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Must Excellent. not mention <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's great. Okay, so... Uh, I, I will say I will say one other thing um, that, that I forgot to say before. Yeah, one later. One of the other things, um, when we were talking about the sort of gender dynamics of this uh, movie... Yeah, yeah, that yeah. when... So, like, Porco goes to um, Piccolo, right, which is his, like, crack mechanic. Yes. And Porco is so, like, pig-headed, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That even when, even when his man, right, like, his mechanic tells him that, like, Fia or Fio is like, she's gonna do a good job. He's the he's bee's like, knees. Nope, I don't believe you. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. just he's he's blinded by his own like uh, prejudices, right? Sure. Even in the face of like of like good, like he's standing in front of like a good reason, right? Like there's a there's a reason you go to this guy Porco, and he's telling you 
that you should trust her. And he's just like, nope, I don't think so. Yeah. So I think this, I think this movie is interested in engaging with those ideas or the, not ideas, those like um, prejudices. Yeah. And I think it couches them in a time in which it like appropriately couches them in a time period where they would be culturally appropriate. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is certainly not interested in, in, in endorsing it endorsing them right and no, in fact i, I think like it's probably that. more interested in subverting them the, the yeah. one if i had to choose one scene that i didn't really like it was the scene where um porco and theo are back at his like hideout and she just gets done yelling at the pirates and reminding them of their honor right yeah and that like, was such a great like, scene they all come to their senses right and they're like yeah, yeah. We're, we're sky pirates we have to have yeah. honor yeah and then um and then she gets all worked up and talk and tells Porco like, "Oh, I'm I'm all worked up." And then she just starts like stripping in front of him, and I was like, oh, "Yes, okay, that's a little, yes, that was a little." So things like that, obviously, like that yeah, yeah, okay, yes. And I'll say this that yeah, just to take care of that, they and they wouldn't have done this now. They should have just aged her up and made it uh, if they wanted to go that way, or not at all. Right? Yeah. It would have been fine if they just left that part out. Okay, so before we assign grades, it's time to take a short commercial break. And now a word from our sponsors. It's lunchtime again, but you're tired of eating the same boring ham sandwich. If you're hankering for something different, come on down to sample V. Most authentic Italian deli cuisine in the world. That's right, in the world. Located right here in the Italiano district of Tokyo, Japan. Just wrap your lips around our delicious meat at (laughs) Red Pig Deli. Mmm. You know, that aftertaste, (laughs) that aftertaste is how you know you're getting the real McCoy. You see, Our secret to tenderizing our meat is to make a public spectacle (laughs) of wading into the Adriatic Sea, simmering all day about inappropriate relationships, and, you know, you know you're done when everything erupts with a long, drawn-out flogging. That's right, don't forget (laughs) to place your bets. Warning, you are what you eat. Red Pig Deli isn't liable for any (laughs) pig-related curses visited upon consumers. Our meat is habit-forming. Red Pig Deli. Will <laughs> Porco your mouth Rosso? <laughs> Yay, sex jokes. Yay. What else was Yay. I going to do? <laughs> Rise know, to the highbrow levels no, of... Course not. No. Uh, <laughs> nobody well, nobody I mean, does. The, nobody could. <laughs> the, money, the money was on the table. You weren't going to leave it there. You just pick it up. <laughs> That's right. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think that we probably have uh, enough of uh, discussion and time to come up with what we want to grade this movie. In that case, I should probably run the sound drop. Oh, I dream. Yeah, I dream. yeah, okay, so down to business. So for me, like I, I'm... I pretty much stated my case before it just came down to my personal viewing experience. And um, I think after the discussion, I I realized that it kind of just hinged on a main character that just wasn't that charismatic enough to carry the film. And maybe I, um, I don't know. I'm speculating as to whether or not it would be better if it was focused on others, but I'll hang my hat on just could have been more charismatic. So I have to go with my viewing experience and I hate to do this, but um, I'm going to give it a C minus based on that. But I will say this, that I am definitely, I understand that I'm in the minority here and that uh, most people really love this movie. So I think you should probably check it out for yourself and and make your own opinion about it. Um, And there's plenty of there to still be liked. And I will also say that I... This just shows me an artist whose whose work is in progress as well, um, and it was from a certain time, and so and I don't blame him for having things that have aged not as good as they could have, maybe. But um, 
uh, what he went from and took here that was working and carried it forward into other films that I think are masterpieces and some of my favorite things. Uh, that said, Devin, where did you land with Porco Rosso? So, yeah, I also had some um, sort of misgivings with this film uh, throughout my watch. But I think overall, while it's not quite that Studio Ghibli can do no wrong, I think that the the quality, the base quality of any product produced by Studio Ghibli is so high um, that for me, even the inconsistencies and, and things that I pointed out uh, didn't quite ruin it. Um, so for me, it was an A minus, just a little below of the other Ghibli movies I've watched. And in agreeing with uh, many of the majority ratings out there as well. So yeah, that's I buy that as well. Uh, and James Pepe, probably going to raise this grade up a little higher uh, with your grade, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to, so I'm going to give this an A. Yeah. Um, but I, what, something I've been thinking about is that like, because like I measure all Studio Ghibli movies against like uh, Spirit Away, right? Mm-hmm. You kind of have in a to. certain sense. You kind of you kind of have to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, this movie, this movie is like good in in different ways than uh, Spirit Away is, and I also I really liked Whisper of the Heart too, um, and I really liked Howl. I really liked Howl too. Um, it's really hard comparing these movies, you know, like saying you know, one, one's better than the other and things like that, because they're all, they're all just like different, different types of, uh, of like perfection. Right. You know? Um, and so I'm not, I don't know that I would say that I like this better than, um, Spirit Away, but perhaps that I like it at least as much as, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm going to give it a. All right. And Jim Scott, you will uh, give us our final grade. Yeah, so um, I'm going to give it a B. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting because, you know, most of the time when you watch a movie, um, you have a certain feeling about how you feel about the movie, and you may or may not reflect on that feeling, but that feeling kind of carries how you feel about the film. Because we discuss the films that we watch, we get that that time to luxuriate, to reflect, to really notice perhaps things that we had not seen, and also to explore more deeply our feelings about the movie. And I think in this discussion, there were a lot of things that were brought up and provided context and help texture um, how I received the movie. I think that if I would have just gone from watching the movie to grading it, it probably would have been a C. But in discussion and, and also seeing, yeah, there were a lot of beautiful moments and uh, mechanisms used in this movie it would be unfair to give it that lower grade because of how I felt about the protagonist. So I give it a B. Yes. Crunch the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's see where we, where we are with this. Uh, Port Goroso is dropped right at a B 3.1, uh, which puts it in line with uh, oh, no. an odd collection of movies here. Wake and Fright, Dr. Strange huh. Love, November. <sighs> oh, <laughs> wow all oh, Pepe Devin, films you me. yeah, yeah. Uh, but also sorry, that was my little joke there but also um, Training Day uh, at a 3.2 Labyrinth that was at a 3.18 that was yeah. me mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah that was his Christmas movie yeah. <laughs> that was last year oh yeah, yeah. that's right <laughs> um, What We Do in the Shadows 3.06 there's one of mine uh, Ben uh, no uh, Nebraska 3.14 We've got a lot in the 3.1 oh, area. This movie's so much better than Nebraska. <laughs> oh, come on. All right. So, so yeah, really do yeah. me some violence and tell me what movies are better than this movie. Oh, uh, so, <laughs> so many. The, the Lighthouse, 
Okay. Enemy. Okay. All right. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> I know those are my movies, but I'm still sort of cringing a little bit. <laughs> 10 Cloverfield Lane, Roma. Oh, God. <laughs> Good <laughs> man. Oh, no. 12 Angry Men, uh, okay. Blair Witch Project. Oh, yeah. wow. Uh, uh, Sounds of the Lambs, one of our favorites. Uh, Black Swan, mm. uh, Spirit of Away, mm. of course. Um, I mean, House Moon Castle, as we know. Uh, Doc's sure. <laughs> Annihilation. Uh, All right. Those are, I was the only show. one that didn't, didn't like Annihilation, Tenor. too. <laughs> but I couldn't keep it from rocketing up the charts. Oh, yeah. There. Annihilation. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't quite foil that one with my angry anti annihilation attitude. Actually, this, this movie, because of, that, um, because of that dream sequence, reminded me of Annihilation. Because it's, I mean, mm-hmm. I think this movie. This movie has a has a sort of higher baseline, perhaps quality than Annihilation, but it still has that like one singular scene in it, in the same way that Annihilation did. That you that sort of sticks out, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one too. Yeah, very yeah. haunting. Yes, and Mocking Bear. Will yeah, forever, that bear's so scary. Oh man, will forever mock my heart with your crazy <laughs> existence. <laughs> I know it's out there somewhere in the multiverse for real. <laughs> Just calling to you. Sticking by it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just calling out. Calling out. All right, cool. Uh, well, thank you for all the the stats there, Devin and everyone for uh, and for causing Pepe so much grief there. Um, as always, that's, oh, that's enjoyable. This is, worst, this is always but, the worst part of the show. <laughs> yeah, but then here's the lift. So we're going we're gonna to yep. find out what we're watching for the final film in Series 10, the Eastern Animation. It's time to roll yeah, the dice. Yeah, I love this roll part the of the show. the next episode. Yeah, it's always good. Uh, okay, so... Who's? I guess there's only one left. Do we actually have someone roll for this? Is this is this where I imagine yeah, we a, a we one sided Mobius guy? strip? Yeah. Okay, that's right. Okay, Mobius strip um, implemented and ready. D- deployed. <laughs> deployed. There we go. Deployed. That's that's the correct terminology. Yes. That's what you do. Uh, that's I think what you do. That sounds right. <laughs> so let's yeah. find out what our final film will be and this will be the audience choice we know because we've eliminated everyone else what did our audience want a one above all else it is a one we will be watching a movie <laughs> called Akira came out in 1988 oh, no. look out you, th- you thought we weren't going to do it uh, it is now streaming Good on Tubi yeah Hmm. And who? Oh, and I haven't seen this one in a long time either. I'll say that I've seen it. I haven't yeah. either. Oh, yeah. baby. Um, so this will be interesting to find out how this has stood the test of time, etc. Because hmm. uh, this, there was maybe no other bigger anime movie ever than Akira. So this yeah. is appropriate that we're reviewing this. So please join us next week um, for uh, episode five, series ten, and we'll also find out who won the series. Um, which sounds like it may be determined by our uh, our rundown recreation next week too. So it's all happening. It's all That'll still be the up first in the time, air. I think, right? Yeah, I'm glad we implemented this system. Time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like it's Good like stuff. we know what we're doing. <laughs> I know that's we that's the scariest fake it that's the scariest <laughs> part of all. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I'm positive, all right, this is Jordan, I'm positive this is Jordan's movie, which means it's the second series in a row we've watched Jordan's movie as the audience choice. Huh. Well, just, maybe he's more than monopoly. one person. I he's, he's, one he person. keeps rolling 20s, I guess. This is a pretty popular movie. I wouldn't be surprised if more than one person submitted. That's true. Yeah, yeah. That pro- um, Now that it's chosen, should I ask? Because I'm kind of curious about yeah, that, yeah. to be honest. Sure, yeah. All right, I'll report back during our whodunit thing. That, that seems like an appropriate time to talk about that during next show. So I'll ask in between and, and find out. Okay, cool. So why don't we, it's, it is actually time that we take care of a little show business. How much do you know about show business, Mr. Valiant? Only there's no business like it. No business I know. Oh, All right. What a good, what a good sound clip. Yeah.
it is. And then I have to do this part. Retraction. Yeah. Uh, so last episode, I again said I would tweet at Netflix demanding that they license the top 10 <laughs> list of Korean <laughs> anime for streaming. And Psych, Jim, I actually hard work for you. I actually I did follow up. So this isn't really a retraction. Wow. I followed through and did so tweet at Netflix the following. There is currently at Netflix, of course, because you have to do that part. That's what the kids tell me. <laughs> There's currently no way to stream any of the top 10 South Korean anime films here in the US. Any chance for a Netflix? For this underrepresented oh, genre. Shit. They have to do it now. They have yeah. to. Damn, that's and good. then I did some it's, hashtags it's through Squid Game on a hashtag. Thought maybe that would get some traction. Um, <laughs> so we'll see. I will report back uh, next, next time. And um, we'll see what happens. However, now that Elon Musk owns Twitter as of like today or something. When this is recorded. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if like Twitter will continue to exist long enough to get results. or Or... Okay, it will work like 10 times better. Let's let's think positively. Like it will start tweeting for you. Yeah, it'll automate responses and like start a war. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Just why actually tweet back when you could use uh um Twitter's auto response and then, you know, that was the end of the planet. So we'll see. Hopefully we get some traction though and not none of the uh, apocalyptic side effects. But uh, either way, we sincerely apologize and ask that you bear with us as we strive to be better. And again, I will update with any results from said tweet. If you do want to support the effort and want to retweet, uh, you just go to at RedHenMedia1 on Twitter and like and retweet. and Maybe we can get some Korean anime representation. Okay. 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 Fan emails. You can write to Ben at <laughs> RedHenMedia.com and we may respond on the show. Let us know how we're doing. Did we get something wrong? Never. Did you arrive at the same conclusions as James Pepe and therefore discover You'd objective right. truth? Mm-hmm. What segment yeah. of the show is your favorite? Where are you listening from? Write us and we may choose your email to read to, to read and respond to on the show. We have more show business. Uh, this is the penultimate episode for the series. And so it is time to play Theme Jeopardy, everyone. All right. Yay. So, yeah. So, basically, because our show is really just a stack of dice all the way down, we're going to roll ever more dice and let fate decide the next series theme. Now, we've all rated a list of over 100 categories, like theme categories, and we take the top five uh, that are rated and then we roll to see which one will be the theme for our next series. Pretty simple. So um, why don't we take a look at our categories and um, maybe we'll also have a little fun surprise for you. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. Nice. Promising things I'm not going to deliver on. All right. I'm really, really edging <laughs> us here. <laughs> <laughs> to co- yeah, to coin a phrase. Um, let's take a look at our <laughs> categories. You started it with that ad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Devin. The categories, please. We have action movies. One of a kind films. Good to be bad anti-hero movies. There's been a murder. <laughs> Eastern <laughs> cinema. Whoa. Hang on. Whoa. <laughs> pew pew lasers. Yeah. And introducing our new winner's choice category, this series' winner's choice is Movies Important for Our Times, submitted by our previous series champion, Jim Scott. So that yeah. is our newest we addition to the show. Wow. Good job. That's what's up. So basically, yeah, winner gets to put their favorite underrepresented category in to the mix. So we may watch that one. Uh, all right. Are we ready to roll some dice Fuck and yeah. see what series yeah. eleven is oh, going to yeah. be like? Do it. Get a roll feeling for this next series. Roll the roll. All them right. Bones. You ready, roll. Devin? I am ready. <laughs> All right. Drum roll. Congratulations, Jim! It is a six. Winner's yes. choice. Wow. wow. Yeah. What? Oh, that paid First off time so instantly. Wow. I love instant gratification. 
that it's so instantly nice. what the hell I'm talking about. I'm so excited. Well done, Jim. That's great. Man. Okay. So excited. So the category one time. time. One more time. Yes. The category Please. will be movies important for our times. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's I like this. It's highly interpretive too. So we should get some interesting choices. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So join Good us category. for series eleven. Um. Yeah. And so everyone, pick a movie that you think fits that category, and we'll submit it to our anonymous sheet. And then you guys, listeners, please go head over to redhenmedia.com slash audience choice. Submit your pick. And you know what? We may just watch and discuss your movie on the show like we're going to discuss it here next week. Again, that's redhenmedia.com slash audience choice. All right, guys, we did it. I think that's probably. We did. Yeah, you know, if I show. check my yeah. notes, I think. Something comes after that. I, I'm going to go ahead and get here. out of here. Yeah. All right. Well, if you can get out of here before I hit this button. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> you didn't quite make it. You almost got away with the chip. <laughs> Just one more thing. Oh, holy moly. Big surprise. Lieutenant Columbo's here telling us that we have time. For just one more thing. This is the segment of the series where each co-host shares a little something from outside the show. So I'll be brief. I finally procured a little game called Elden Ring, my friends. Oh, wow. <laughs> so my, my journey awesome. begins. Yes, it does. Uh, yeah, I've, so I barely play it. I just got through like the, the, the first part and I'm running around a field and uh, went into my first... Uh, uh, cavern and got my ass handed to me a few times yep. um so yeah yes. just just really the tip of the iceberg so but, game um, right but it's it's still fun so and i like challenges like this is, i intend yeah. to get very very good at fighting and learn all the ins and outs of the game so um expect lots of uh a complaining in our video game discussion room <laughs> in, in discord yeah. and b like begging for like hints and builds and stuff so so dust off or, uh, you know, knock off the rust on anything uh, Elden Ring because incoming. <laughs> Don't complain too much or Devin will get upset with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good pro tip. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> Elden Ring is a thing. Um, yeah. So more news on that. Later, Elden I thing. Guess. Yes. Also, I also, just real quick, I also have uh, the new uh, Rocksmith Plus for PC and have my bass guitar plugged in. I'm learning bass. I, I know a little mm. guitar enough to accompany nice. myself singing. But uh, bass is new to me, and Hunter wants to play lead guitar, so I get to play bass in his band. He's instructed me on the bass player. So I'm learning bass. And that's nice. been a fun, fun thing to do as well. And we can plug in our two instruments and play uh, Rocksmith at the same time. So that's been kind of fun nice hell yeah when i say kind of it's it's pretty fucking fun i'll say that <laughs> <laughs> yeah so those are my just one more things I, I i got a bonus one this week i did so poorly in the uh rundown recreation i just had to take something for myself <laughs> it was that extra thing <laughs> so feel free to have an extra thing too as we always tend to do anyway what am i talking about <laughs> what's your five things this week Devin? <laughs> <laughs> well my first thing uh, and the crewmate there we go. Ruin this, lifts up a, he just lifts up a scroll and it just like unravels right to right. the floor <laughs> proclamation <laughs> yeah uh, I picked up it's yeah it's almost impossible to see with my green screen oh, but hey. Howl's Moving Castle the book by Diane Wynne Jones um, I have right. read a bit of it about a third of the way through give or take and this is only the first it is a series um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I, I believe based on the pacing that the Ghibli film is the first book uh, only, but I could be wrong. Um, from what I've read so far, some some interesting tidbits for you all. Uh, Sophie as a character is, is a little more, well, they really play up the shift when she becomes an old woman even more so. It's just something I, I liked in the movie, but it's even more in the book where she is very timid and uh, like very much a, a yes man, a yes person in the beginning of the book um and then after she transforms like really starts to question some of the things in her life and uh for instance she um goes to visit letty her sister who actually in the book is not letty there's a a plot line where letty is supposed to be sent to work at the bakery while her other sister is supposed to be sent to a witch to become like an apprentice and learn magic 
And uh, it turns out that, that this is like their wicked stepmother who does this, who sends them off because uh, she can't afford to send them to school. And in the book, they actually want opposite things. Uh, her other sister, I can't remember the name of her now, want, would rather like find a husband and get married, which was the whole point of sending Letty to the bakery. And Letty would prefer to learn magic. Uh, so the the first sister goes to the witch's house, gets a, steals a spell from her to change their appearance and swaps appearances with Letty. And so the actual Letty she talks to in the bakery is her other sister, assuming the... the You're telling me there's another complication in that story? I know. Yeah, which I, <laughs> I feel like would have been a fun little it. plot point, but yeah, what it's like a long yeah, no, that's cool. Could you hold the book uh, up again? It was frozen and I've unfrozen yeah, yeah. the video speed. That is, that's a nice looking... It's a great oh, design, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, I like yeah. the cover. That's nice. Um, cool. But, uh, It'll follow through, man. Yeah, and uh, but anyway, after talking to her sister, when, when she's still young and talking to her sister, her sister's like, yeah, our, our horrible stepmother did all these terrible things to us. And Sophie's like, what are you talking about? Our stepmother loves us. Like, what, what do you mean, wicked stepmother? We have a great stepmother. And then as soon as she becomes old, she's like, yeah, fuck this lady and leaves and like bails on the house. <laughs> like immediately, like as soon as she's an old woman, she's like, yeah, she is kind of awful, isn't she? And I'm out of here. Um, nice. So that's interesting. So it was a blessing instead of a curse. Yeah, Calcifer is described much more like horrendously. He's like a like a full face with like a beard made of like blue fire, and it, it sounds a lot less appealing to look at than the version we get <laughs> in the movie. Um, so that's that's cool. So uh, positive change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Overall, yeah, it's it's cool. There are some small differences. It's definitely written like towards young children. It's a very simple book, but I, I kind of like that. It's sort of a way to decompress and you know, just an easy read. Um, usually, when I'm falling asleep, I read a couple pages. So. I'm an enjoyment. Excellent. It. Highly recommend. Excellent. Nice. Thanks, man. That's that's really cool. And uh, I'm sure that everyone who likes Howl's Moving Castle are, will be inspired. I'm going to pick up a copy now and check it out myself. So thanks. On my paper white, though. I've been still enjoying that. So, uh, and it doesn't, even look that, it doesn't even look that long. So you're saying it was a series? Or possibly uh, yeah, a series? Yeah, I don't know how something? many books I guess there we'll are. Find yeah, out. I, believe, I believe there were a few sequels. Um, but yeah, this one is makes sense if it was popular. You better feed yeah. the literary this machine. This one's a little, a little over four hundred pages, but they're they're spaced like a children's book. There's wide, uh, a sort of. It margins. looked like a Harry Potter ish book. If if you know people know what those. Yeah, like, probably right? close to the first Harry yeah. Potter book. Yeah, in length. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, excellent. So cue that one up for me as well. And uh, James Pepe, what have you got for us this week on just one more thing? I would like to make an odd, so a sort of odd recommendation. So, okay. us us being uh, super super nerds, we know what uh, bestiaries are because we mm. play yes. D and D, yes. and we look to our bestiaries to find all of our fun monsters to throw at our players. But me being a super mega ultra nerd, <laughs> I also know what a that bestiaries are a real thing, and that. Mm -hmm. In medieval times, they made bestiaries about animals. And not just animals, but also like mythical beasts, right? Because sometimes Excellent. they thought these beasts were real. Sometimes they, they didn't, or it's, it's not, quite, not quite known what they thought about these things. Um, but a lot of these entries, even for just regular animals, are wild. <laughs> so I'd like to give you guys a little, a little taste. Please. All right. This is yeah. the, so, yeah. so I'm going to read this from a website that's called the Medieval Bestiary, and the web address is just bestiary.ca. And so this is the entry on hyenas. Okay. So this this entry first says a hyena is a beast that eats human corpses and changes sex. So here's some general so, so here's some general attributes of the hyena. According to the law. What law that is, I don't, law of the jungle or something, I don't know. Hyenas must not be eaten because they are dirty. Hyenas can change their sex. Sometimes they are male, other times female. They live near tombs and eat the dead bodies they find there. Okay, that's all pretty sort of not so weird yet, right? Okay. There is a stone a in the hyena. <laughs> <laughs> there is a stone in the hyena's eye. Some say in the stomach of its young. That will give a person the ability to predict the future if the stone is placed under the person's tongue. Hell yeah. Checks out. <laughs> oh my God. That's, that's news to me. Yeah. Good yeah. news. 
Hyenas, hyenas will circle a house at night, calling out words with the voice of a man. Anyone who is deceived and goes out to investigate is eaten. <laughs> like a mockingbird. A dog. <laughs> yeah, right, like a mockingbird. A dog that crosses a hyena's shadow will lose its voice. But yep. you guys didn't know that. That checks out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The hyena's spine is rigid, so it so it tur- so when it turns, it must move its entire body. Sure. <laughs> the <Yep>. result <laughs> the result of a mating between a hyena and a lioness is called that a lucrota or lucrota. Oh and, <laughs> wow. And so this is the this is the allegory or the the allegorical or moral reading of hyenas. The hyena represents untrustworthy, two-faced people, or or it represents humanity, who first worship God and then worship idols. It can also signify a greedy and lustful man. <laughs> so if you want more all over the place. <laughs> fucking fucking gems like that, go to the medieval mystery and read. Read wow. all about your favorite animals. That's what's up. It was written by this. This isn't this someone isn't really this took. Is, I mean, this is real. I wanted to say it was like written by like a third grader on a schoolyard, just making shit up and pretending it. You know, they knew about something, but it, they, it seems much more in depth. Like someone really put a lot of thought into this. Mm-hmm. What it Fable, sounds more like, you know, what it sounds to me like it, it reads a lot. Like I, I built an AI to read like. Wikipedia pages about right. animals <laughs> and made it write a fictional animal. You know, it there reads you like AI written stuff. Well, I mean, some of it, some of it makes sense, right? Because like hyenas are scavengers, and like the fact that they're found around like graveyards makes sense if they're digging up corpses to eat them, right? So like that makes sense. Um, wh- like how this idea got started about like the stone and the hyena's eye, and it can let you tell the future if you put it under your tongue, and that is fascinating. This thing about this thing about dogs crossing their shadow will make them lose their voice. I have no idea. How you that see, this could, is this is good fodder for like writing, about. though. Like, yeah, who knows? Like, it, it's good fodder for just like researching those threads as well into into myth, you know, and finding out where it might have come from. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there may be an interesting like if, story there. Maybe there's maybe there's no lead as to where it came from, though. But uh, it'd be interesting to take a swing at it. If you're a little, if, I, if I've piqued your interest, you can also go, do a Google in, image search for, I think it's called the Pope's Rhino. And so you'll see, like, oftentimes, oftentimes people who are making these things will go, will, will find people who, like, for example, with the rhino, like, live, like, have been to Africa and seen a rhino. And then they'll, that person will describe to the medieval artist or whatever, a rhino, right? But the person who's drawing it has never seen it and so it's just it's like a police sketch of a rhino right yeah and so it's like oh, okay i can see that there's a rhino there but this guy has clearly never seen a rhino you know and it's so they're it's funny like this is how the medieval world worked yeah yeah and even it's, even like other backwards. even like other ethnicities of humans they would like meet you know, yeah, Egyptians, right. and then like come and describe them in this like alien, very racist way, and then like yeah. they would draw them, and they would look even more bizarre. You know? Did you guys ever see that old SNL skit, Theodoric Barber of York, but with Steve Martin? <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, it reminds me of that. Like, you know, it's weird how archaic uh, medicine used to be. Before we would have uh, thought this was some kind of witchcraft causing the stomach ailment, but now we know <laughs> yeah. that there's a small gnome living in your stomach, and that we need to bleed you <laughs> yeah, out right. in the swamp and uh, like held you up by your ankles overnight. Yeah, right. <laughs> We've come <laughs> yeah, so <exactly>. far. <laughs> yeah. Classic. So if you want to read more interesting um, entries about things like hyenas, but also like mythical beasts, like there's entries for griffins and. And uh, excellent. And there's 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 entries for like salamanders, which are obviously real creatures, but you, but like the mythology that surrounds salamanders about how like they live in fire and stuff. That's all from mm-hmm. these medieval. Here's pieces. an idea. Nice. We we force a DM to use this uh, bestiary as an actual bestiary in the game and like generate yeah, yeah. stats from great. these. That would be super fun. I was just thinking I'm not going to do it, but somebody else I, should do I it. Was, okay, Jim, you're doing it. I was it. just you. thinking that as far as like right. extra flavor. 
Yeah. That would yeah. be so cool if you you fight a pack of hyenas and then you like search the corpse, right? You Look out for the eye. This, this, yeah. This stone, and then you don't know what it does, and then yeah, it lets you see the future. Super Story cool. fodder. Yeah. Story fodder. That's great. Yeah, Thanks for sharing. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna check that out. Fun. So watch out for that hyena in Jim's next game, everyone. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jim, speaking of gentleman Jim Scott, what have you got for us this week on just one more thing, my friend? Yeah, speaking of games, so um I've been once again, because it is a back and forth, gravitating away from social media. Um, I deleted Facebook on my phone. Not that it was like that much okay. of a problem as far as the doom scroll or not doom scroll, but just the endless scrolling. But I would at mm -hmm. times find myself scrolling and I'm like, man, I need to put this shit away. So I got rid of that. Um, one of my morning habits is watching YouTube videos, sometimes as long as an hour or two. You know, um, I don't do that uh, except once or well, twice Well, there goes our week. show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, once or twice a week. And um, it's a lot less time and I have a lot less interest. And I've been spending... Yeah, that that time actually listening to podcasts you know where i can kind of oh, imagine we're back in, in my it. mind or you know doing that type of things because i want to become less distracted with that being said and, and also excuse me um i feel kind of bad because you know through this series i've been recommending all these youtube podcasts are still phenomenal you know but I feel like we definitely have to put boundaries on our, um, you know, investment in social media. So with that being said, I have a book recommendation, but right. it is a stand in because the book I'm actually reading by this author, I do want to take lock stock and smoking barrels and dump a lot of it in my home brew campaign in the future so i'm okay. not going to tell you what that book is but this <laughs> one is just as good so this is called oh, nice. parable of the sower but by octavity e butler and i think this is actually perfect being that we are uh very soon going into uh movies that are important for our times so octavia e butler was because she passed away in 2006 she was a pioneering writer of science fiction she wrote books and stories through the 70s 80s 90s and early 2000s as one of the first african-american and female science fiction writers butler wrote novels that concern themes of injustice towards african-americans global warming women's rights, and political disparity. So a wide range of subjects. On this particular one, just going off of the kind of the blurb up on top, uh, it says, brilliant, endlessly rich, pairs well with 1984 or The Handmaid's Tale. Now, I haven't actually read this book yet, but I've heard a lot of accolades about the book. This one is part of a two book series. This one got um, New York Times Notable Book of the Year, but the second book called Parable of the Talents won the Nebula Award. So um, pretty, wow. pretty prestigious. So just real quick, I'm just going to read the first paragraph, which is as follows. When global climate change and economic crisis led to social chaos in the early 2020s and given this book was written in the early 90s mm -hmm. california became full of dangers from pervasive water shortage to masses of vagabonds who will do anything to live to see another day 15 year old lauren alamina lives inside a gated community with her preacher father family and neighbors sheltered from the surrounding anarchy in a society where any vulnerability is a risk, she suffers from hyper-empathy, empathy, a debilitating sensitivity to others' emotions. And I'll leave you with that. Or nice. think she's sick. We just need to re-educate her. <laughs> yeah, wow, that sounds promising. Yeah. Especially uh, 
Yeah, yeah. And especially with all the the awards and everything, that's you know you're pretty much guaranteed a good read there. And um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when, and I can. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. What's your question? Oh, I just I did have a question. Like when uh, you said it was sure. early '90s, so when was she an active writer? Or do you, she do, you do you have like writer. a range? I do. Uh, so okay. she wrote from the late '70s on okay. to the early 2000s. Until- and Until and I'm died. certain mm-hmm, I'm certain she would have wrote longer, but unfortunately her her demise, um, and she she fell. Um, I believe it was in Washington State. She fell, and from what I gather, the suspicion is she was suffering a stroke, and then she fell. But and ultimately she, she died yeah. died as a result. Yeah, um, yeah I did see an interview sad. with I seen an interview with her on uh, YouTube. Um, I watched uh, I watched Democracy Now, which is a liberal um, uh, kind of a news uh, channel, so to speak. And they pulled up an early interview they had done with her um, in the in the two thousands. It kind of had a part to play in the story they were covering. Um, and she is a well she's very well spoken. And, and the book that I'm reading that's not parable of the sower is so fascinating. Um, as soon as I started it, it was like, it pulled me in and um, I can now see, cause that's the first book I've read by her. I will read this one um, eventually. I can see why she is so lauded for sure. Yeah. Cool. So although you haven't read that book, just to summarize, the other book that you mm-hmm. are reading by her is excellent, yeah. and but you don't want to tell us because you're going to use some of those ideas in a D and D campaign, so That's you're right. avoiding spoiler. Yeah, cool. I you got it. it. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Thanks. This reminds me of Hal's moving trivia from last week. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Hal's which I just had to. So yeah, I just had to edit that last <laughs> night and and release it. It's just like super fun to. <laughs> watch me Hell try yeah. to, to to follow along oh my yeah. god those man funny. those those answers you were picking were so silly ben i don't they know why great. you thought they were right yeah. totally I random you those are the right answers <laughs> now i did i stand I, by I, it. I thought i, I thought all those things <laughs> I, was having a, I was having a similar problem and i followed along with the logic of you know what was going on but i didn't place the letters in the right <laughs> you know rotation uh man uh as soon as i, I lost yeah, it, it after the second one yeah no as soon as i lost it after the second one that was it there was no the, yeah. if you lose it once there's no getting it back i think yeah um or at least you have to like guess it. right but uh it right. was it was interesting and um no but thank you all for your just one more things and uh sure definitely another one to queue up uh on the kindle paperweight which i'm enjoying i walk around with it like it's nice. my uh my binky or something <laughs> very cool <laughs> my precious <laughs> all right uh so thanks for some more recommendations in that regard so guys we have reached the actual end of the we show did we did it i think i'll miss you most of all dorothy is letting us know it's time to say goodbye um i'm not crying you're crying you know that thing no okay well write to us and tell <laughs> us write to us with a new joke okay so uh we're gonna send off our co-host with a little uh co-host send-off that i like to call the co-host send-off <laughs> oh, <laughs> nailed it. here's your send-off <laughs> start with devin schwartz i have been devin schwartz you can find me at devin schwartz one on um musketer i don't know and uh, oh, game God, over, man. Game over. <laughs> well done. Yeah. We'll see how that pans out. And James Pepe. I have been and still am James Pepe. And uh, thanks for thanks for coming out and, and watching it or listening. And hope to see you back uh, next week for Akira. Fuck yeah. <laughs> I think that's the uh, sub uh, title on the poster. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh Jim Scott. 
Yeah, I'm Jim Scott, and farewell, gentle listeners and friends. Take care. Indeed. And this has been I'll Look at Yours If You Look at Mine. And now that you've looked at ours, we hope to look at yours soon. If you enjoy the show, be sure to smash that like button, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, give us a five-star review, dot your I's, cross your T's, sign here, initial here, and don't forget to tell your friends. And today's parting sentiment, if you're ever flying too high in a World War I era airboat and start seeing ghost planes, please do consider descending to a lower altitude and getting some oxygen to your brain rather than chasing the ghosts. Give oxygen a chance. And remember to watch Akira 1988, now streaming on Tubi and Hulu for next week's show. Until next time.